Throughout history, nations have experimented with various forms of government, from tyrannies and monarchies to democracies and republics, the world has witnessed the triumphs and failures of these governing institutions. So where does America fit within these categories? Are we a democracy or a republic? How did the Founding Fathers choose America's government? And most importantly, which form of government works best? Join historian David Barton with special guests Glenn Beck, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and more as they explore the America our founding fathers envisioned. What if America's story is bolder, more colorful, and more compelling than you ever imagined? This is Foundations of Freedom. Welcome to Foundations of Freedom, where we look back at important aspects of our common shared heritage about which most folks today hear absolutely nothing. Joining me today is our co-host, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Congresswoman Bachman is a federal tax attorney. She's a very successful businesswoman. She's also a very successful mom, having raised five of her own kids and 23 foster kids. And she's also a member of Congress and serves on the House Intelligence Committee, which really is in charge of all of our national secrets. So a very important responsibility. Michelle, it's great to have you. Thanks Thank for being you. here it's with us. Thank you. It's great to be back again. This is an exciting subject today because we're talking about the best government. We've seen a lot of the worst governments over history and over time. We'll talk about that. But we're talking about the best government. And I think there's, the Bible has a lot to say about that. You know, it's amazing. The Bible actually covers different forms of government, which ones work well mm -hmm. and which ones don't. Don't. Let's so take our guidance. first question. Good. I think we have some people who have a question for you today. Every nation in the world has governments, and those governments seem to work well for those people. But it doesn't work the same for all people. So variety is good, but why push one form of government over another form of government? You know, David, I don't know that that's exactly true, that all governments work for people, because just ask people living in China. Yeah. Ask people who are living in Russia today. Ask a woman who's living in Iran how that's working for yeah. her. I don't know that every government really is equal. Isn't that called a philosophy of relativism? It, Talk about that. It is, but we really teach that a lot. I, I'm appointed in a lot of states by state boards of education governors to do social studies standards in those states. And when you look at what's in the textbooks, one of the things that we're teaching, I, apparently we don't, we don't want anyone to feel bad about anything they do. <laughs> So we're telling kids, oh, all governments work well. One of the textbooks that was brought for adoption in Texas said that the best form of government ever invented in the history of mankind is communism. Really? Why in the what? world would a textbook writer put that in when it's so patently obvious? We have well, people today living under communism who are being killed. Look at North Korea. That's right. But the problem we have is what we don't do in schools today is we don't have any type of accountability to show what works and what doesn't work. We put the ideas out there and never judge them. And Jesus said you judge a tree by yeah, its fruits. Right. And, and the problem we have today is we have political leaders. Now, some of the ones that you've had to deal with say, Oh, every nation is exceptional. Every nation well, is our, superb. Our president said that. Uh, that's right. Our president said Professors that every say that all the time. Professors say America is no different from any other nation. In fact, all the president of the Russia same. recently said that Russia is an exceptional nation. <laughs> well, and, maybe for the wrong thing. And, and by that standard. Now, let's just go through some governments real quick here. America, we've had one form of government since 1789, our Constitution. We have. We have. We have. Same period of time. France has had 16 constitutions, same period of time. Haiti has had 23 constitutions since 1801. Venezuela has had 25 constitutions since 1811. Brazil has had seven constitutions since 1822. Ecuador is 20 since 1830. The Philippines, seven since 1899. You go to Russia, four constitutions since 1918. Poland, seven since 1919. Nigeria, nine since 1922. Afghanistan, six since 1923. Iraq, four since 1925. South Africa, five since 1931. Thailand, 17 since 1932. South Korea, a great ally, six constitutions since 1948. China, four since 1954. Ghana, four since 1957. What you're telling us is there's a common thread. There's a common thread. And the common thread is that not all nations work. 
Not all governments work. Uh, now, we've gone through a bunch of nations here, and they all instability, have instability. Instability. Instability Turmoil, is what's up common. Up and down. Egypt, as a matter of fact, has been rewriting its constitution. That's right. I was over there meeting with their uh, Judiciary Committee that, as it was rewriting it. Turmoil is That's the right. norm. It's the norm. And in a lot of these countries, when you have a change of government, someone dies. It's an assassination, or they get That's chased right. out of the country and they die. That's a very typical. We have only known as a normative. Stability. stability so that when we have a presidential inauguration sure you see a lot of ads on TV and a lot of kerfuffling for a couple of years sometimes it goes on but no one dies no one does you have a fairly um, smooth transition of power that isn't the way the world works Man, when, people when, don't realize in America that. when you go to a political meeting nobody walks into that meeting expecting rebel forces to come in with machine guns and open fire on them well that's right or like for instance we hear a lot in the news about Israel and Gaza take a look at Gaza in Gaza there was a one election when Hamas came in and there were supposed to be continuous elections afterwards there that's was happened. there was never one again that's right the one thing that particularly secular progressive people don't like to do is measure results. No. They, I've got a great idea. Does it work or not? Well, I don't know, but it's a great idea. Well, you want to talk about different forms of government. Totalitarianism. Let's go ahead and get a definition of that. I think one that we've seen recently with a lot of the um, Islamic Jihad uprisings, one thing that they call for is what's called a caliphate, where a caliph or one person is running that form That's of right. its government. That's totalitarianism. Give me another example of totalitarianism. Well, key, key to a totalitarian government is that it's very centralized mm -hmm. and it doesn't tolerate differences of opinion. Isn't that interesting? Hey. Isn't that that's interesting? That's sounding more familiar, hmm. isn't it? Hmm. Because as we talked about in previous episodes, we talked about how for a creator God who made all of man in his image and likeness, his main goal was to lift up the individual mm -hmm. and give us maximum freedom. It sounds to me, David, like you're saying under totalitarianism, it is the least amount of freedom. Yeah, it's Be one of those that have the least amount. That's exactly right. Because a centralized government. And they don't want individuals control. and they don't want individual opinions. We'll tell you what to believe. Now, you have a lot of that in the Bible as well, because you, you had the emperors in the Bible, you had the Caesars that were in the Bible, the Pharaohs. I mean, all of those are totalitarian mm -hmm. governments, and they still, those type of governments still exist across the world. Bible covers that. It is not a good form of government to have. So we can point to a lot of nations in the world that have that form of government. It's not a fun government to be in. It's not a fun form of government. And I think just an interesting statistic that the 20th century was the bloodiest century in all of recorded human history. And there's a book that came out by R.J. Rummel called Death by Government. Mm -hmm. And it cataloged the millions upon millions of people who were killed, millions of people who were killed by Stalin in Russia, millions of people who were killed by Mao in mm -hmm. uh, the former communist um, regime, still communist, but the former regime under Mao Zedong, and also other and governments. Pol Pot and all Pol the Pot. other. Yeah. Looking at potentially 100 million people killed. Totalitarian governments. By totalitarian exactly. governments. And by the way, talking about textbooks, I challenge any parent to go to their school oh, and get yes. their world history textbook and see if it says that Stalin killed 50, 70 million people. See if it says that Pol Pot eradicated several million. See if it says anything about Mao and, and how many we never talk we about didn't have it in is. my textbook it, see, when I was growing well, up. That's why we that's why we spout this this rhetoric that's that right. oh, all governments are good if it works for them. You don't know if it works for them until you start seeing how many well, now, bodies I'll, are buried in the grave. That's right. And I'll tell you, David, the parent has the right to know that's the right. content that their child is being taught. So no matter if it's digital or in a textbook, you're exactly right. Every parent or guardian should go to their child's school and say, I want to see the content my child mm -hmm. will get, the worksheets, the tests, everything my child will have. You have a right as a parent to demand that you be allowed to see what your child is learning. And by the way, and if a teacher or a principal says, oh, we can't let you see that, red bells, whistles, alarms ought to go off all over you. Say, whoa. I'm a taxpayer, that's there because I'm paying money. You're not gonna show me what you're teaching my kid. 
No way. And the most precious item that any parent has is their child. That's right. Their child's mind and their child's future. That's right. And that parent has more interest than anyone has That's in right. that child, and they have the right. The next form of government is monarchy. That's pretty simple. Pretty simple. That's the one that we threw off. Pretty simple. That's that's what we threw off, and that's what you find a lot of in the Bible as well, because yeah. you have King Solomon and King David and King Saul and King Josiah and all these different. But there's different forms of monarchies. Yeah. For example, there's still a monarchy in in England, but it's a really weak form of monarchy. It's what you might call it a, a constitutional or a limited monarchy because you got a parliament and that parliament pulls back the monarch's powers. And that happened back in the 1300s when they got the Magna Carta and other things. Then in the glorious revolution of Great Britain, they limited the power of the monarch even more. Now, Versus a present day kingdom, and I, one example I would give is in the country of Jordan. That's a pretty strong king in Jordan. He's actually very active in the civic affairs of his country. So unlike a queen Elizabeth, who you see in more ceremonial functions, and who really doesn't touch policy at all, the King of Jordan does. does. He's very involved in the mm -hmm. policy of his country, as was his father, and now they're grooming the Crown Prince of Jordan to do the same. But what about that form of government? With well, uh, that form of government can become totalitarian very quickly. If you happen to have a really good king, like you had with William and Mary under the, the Glorious Revolution in Great Britain, that's fine. But if you've got a King George III, like America had when, when we were a British uh, colony, that's not a good deal. And, and by the way, the Bible actually, when, when Israel shifted to a monarchy, God intended to be a limited monarchy. That's a very important point. And he did so by saying, King, before you can be king, you will write down the entire law of Moses, because that's what you're governed by. And only a couple of kings did that in Israel's history. Everybody else ignored it, and then they became totalitarian. Because when we read First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, you read about bad king, bad king, bad mm -hmm. king, then an occasional good king seems to be thrown in. But when a king understands again that he's limited in his power, that he can only have the power according to the laws of God, that's a good king. But kings who become a law unto themselves, that's a bad king. And it's just as true today in forms of government that we have various forms of government as it was back in the time of Israel. It's absolutely the same. And absolutely. then a republic, a constitutional republic. My favorite. Your favorite. <laughs> this is one that you find in the Bible preceding Israel becoming a monarchy. Back under Moses when they were in the wilderness and God established that government, uh, they chose out from among them. We're told in Exodus 18, 21, choose out from among you leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. And that was actually his father-in-law. That was his father-in-law. Who instructed Jethro, who Moses that. that's because right. he saw how exhausted Moses that's was right. trying to lead the people. And that's when he said, look, you, you have to have people that help you. But like you said, it was somebody who'd be in charge of maybe 50 people, somebody in charge of 100, somebody in charge of 1,000. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would be a different level of authority and jurisdiction. It's your local county state and federal is yeah. what we would compare it to today. And at that level, you elect someone to represent you. You're not, you're not the one speaking directly. It's not a democracy where everyone votes. This is, instead of having 330 million Americans vote, we have 435 mm -hmm. of you guys vote. Mm -hmm. And so in a republic, you elect people to represent you as they go. Now, you've got some weak forms of republics, which are parliamentary systems. They're, they're not as strong. And in a parliamentary system, the elected people are the power until the next election. But you have a better Again, form. Again, it's not a written system of law. That's right, it's not. That's the problem. It's like, this is my banknote. The Constitution is our personal banknote. That's right. Note. It says, I get to own that. My inalienable rights are mine. So it, it, it maximizes for me, and yet it limits someone like me That's right. who holds an election certificate. That's right. I can only do it for a certain area of authority. That's a good thing. That's the constitutional That's the highest republic, form. The highest, the highest form, form, which we have. And in that we form... We in America... Well, go ahead. Well, the founders did an exhaustive study of government. That's what we're talking That's about right. right now. What's the best government? Imagine what they went through to secure our liberty. They had just thrown off the most economic, mighty nation in the world, the greatest military power in the world. This little ragtag army won this improbable war. And so these very brilliant men decided, let's search the world and all of history. Which would be the best form of government? We're starting from scratch. Why not do the best? Yeah. And after their exhaustive search, 
That's what they discovered. They come up. A constitutional right. republic would be most in line with the Word of God. And it's, it's so key because in every form of government, you always want to ask, what's the source of power? And in a weak republic, the source of power is your elected officials. In a strong republic, constitutional republic, your source of power is the written law. That's right. And, it's, and it officials doesn't matter. who recognize that. That's right. Who, officials who come under. Who come the, under that highest under power. The, because remember, the law is the protection for the people. That's right. It's the people who are protected. That's why when you say that no man is above the law, that's to protect the people, people that's right. from the ruler. The people are the ones who set the boundaries under God, and as long as the rulers stay below that, then you have liberty. Yeah. When the leaders rise above that level, then you got problems. That's right. You have to have the right tension and the right balance so that you can keep it together and it works that's right. well. We have also an oligarchy that you see today in Russia, where you have a couple of kingpins under the main czar, and basically uh, the way it works in Russia is you have a guy who gets control over all telecommunications, he reaps all the profits. Another guy gets the whole mining industry, and that's his mm -hmm. area of authority. Another guy gets to do oil, and it's corrupt. They skim off the yep. profits from themselves. Nobody knows what the price of anything is because the price is whatever you have to pay off in bribes. It's a terrible, terrible system. system. And the power is in a small group that is unaccountable to any other, and that's a problem. And uh, you don't have to go as far as Russia oh. to see an oligarchy. You can go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, no, we, we can go to the state Supreme Court. Oh, no, because they say, we don't care. The Iowa Supreme Court's a great example. Yeah, we've had marriage in Iowa for 161 years, but the seven of us have decided we're not doing it that way anymore. And it only took four of the seven it only took to four make of the that seven. decision. So it's who cares like how many million people you have in Iowa? We have a group now telling us what our values will be, what our morals will be, what our education system will be, what our criminal justice will be, who we can and cannot punish in courts. I yeah. mean, you, Isn't you, it interesting? The courts now say, hey, we'll take the big issues. You legislature, you maybe get to decide load limits on turnip trucks. We're the ones who are going to That's decide right. the definition we'll of marriage. We'll decide all the things. We'll be That's the right. ones who decide if life gets protected or not. And that's when you get out of balance that's, on that issue of jurisdiction. And Thomas and you're right, Jefferson, that's an oligarchy. Thomas Jefferson, called, he said, if you're not careful, if you allow the courts to make policy, they will become an oligarchy. And guess what? Here he was right. That's exactly what happened. Because at a certain point, when you throw off all the constraints of law, which a lot of people are demanding right now, that I don't want any laws. I want to be able to do whatever I think is right in my own eyes. That's when you get to this next form of government called anarchy. Yeah. And it's scary to me, David, how many people today in America are demanding anarchy. Yeah. In other words, every man does that which is right they in his They don't call it anarchy. Eyes. They they have a more sophisticated thing. They can be a libertarian. We don't want government telling us what Wait a minute, you have to have some moral rights and wrongs. We have to be able to tell you you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't but see, they're saying we, we want to be moral libertarians and we want to be government libertarians. You can't be moral libertarians. You, you cannot be. At that point, John Quincy Adams said, if you do that, he said, you then rule by the law of the tiger and the shark. Hey, my magazine's got 30 bullets. Yours only got 20. I, I'm, I'm the ruler. You and cannot do that. ultimately, a lot of people who want to be libertarian, we have a lot of sympathy for because what they're requesting is limited that's government. Exactly right. But that's one thing we need to recognize. We've got history as a guide. That's right. We have, we have to know what is the best form of government, and anarchy isn't it. Well, Just we've got like, the Bible as a guide, too, because three times the Bible condemns that as, quote, every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. And that was the end of the Old there was, Testament, That was remember? the end of it. That was the end of the Old Testament. That was not well, a good place. That was not a good place to be. So we've seen that anarchy is, even though it's tempting, and sounds good, it leads to oppression and tyranny. You lose your liberty. You lose your liberty. And that's, again, I think some of the false mantra of democracy. I am shocked at the number of Republicans who will say of the United States that we're a democracy. Yeah. And I, I'm floored because I know from reading our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Northwest Ordinance, we are a constitutional republic. In fact, it says it, Article 4, Section 4, 
that our government guarantees to the states a Republican form of government. Yeah. So the states have the right to demand that. That's what we are. We're not a democracy. No, and, and uh, let's hold democracy for just a minute because I want to come back to that. Let's go ahead and interject the seventh form of government then return to democracy. Okay, that sounds good. The seventh form of government is theocracy. And in the Bible, you see that with Eli and with Samuel and with others who God, they, they rule in Satan, the name of define God. Define it. Define uh, a theocracy it. is a ruler who says, I'm ruling in the name of God. God speaks directly to me. I'll tell you all what to do. Like an own. Ayatollah today or an Imam today. That's right. Yes. Um, all of those forms of government is God to me. You got no response back. You, you only do what I tell you. You because didn't elect me. God. God put me here. Mm -hmm. I am the voice. It's the divine right of King's philosophy. And, and by the way, for people who like to beat up on, on God-fearing people in America, oh, if you Christians get involved in politics, you'll turn into a theocracy. Impossible as long as you have elections. A theocracy means that no one shows you. You put yourself there or you think God put you there or whatever. But as long as there are elections in America, there's no way Christians will have a theocracy. As long as we have a constitution, there's no way. So there for is you no to be Christian involved, theocracy there is no, in the world right. today. There is no Jewish theocracy in the world today. There are only Islamic theocracies that's right. in the world well, there's today. There's th secular theocracies there, too. Oh, well, the, yeah, the, oh, very good. That <laughs> yeah. is true. That's that right. Is they, true. they think they hear from that's a higher true. power. That's true. That. So let's let's go back to democracy for a minute because this thing that you just hit. Um, the, the religious people that came to America, like the pilgrims and others, when they came here, it was interesting that John Robinson, the pastor of the pilgrims, w when the pilgrims got here, he didn't make it. He sent the pilgrims yeah. here. He said, here's what you do. W w when you get to America, he said, do not carry over there into that new land the bad customs we have over here. Over here, we have kings. He says, remember that God did not give kings That's to right. Israel. So when they got here, they were told, remember, the form of government they rejected is what God had given them in Exodus 18.21. Yeah. Choose out your own leaders. That's a representative republic. And so when they got here, they set up annual elections. They didn't do biannual elections like we do. They had an election every year in both church and state. You chose your church leaders and your state leaders. And I, I've got at home a couple of books that are election sermons. Yes. So that the pastors faithfully out of the pulpit before the election, they gave long sermons right. about what to look for. They talk about taxation and issues. This was something we did in America did. For, Big centu time. for centuries. So that the church saw themselves as having to teach the people what to look for. As a matter of fact, here's some quotes from Founding Fathers just to prove we're not a democracy. Take James Madison. He said, democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security of the rights of property, and have, in general, been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Now that's a guy who studied history. It is, and it's amazing. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. And it's and the story of nations is how quickly a nation goes into demise. Yeah. And that's why we need to be vigilant. So we have a couple of action items that we need to yeah, talk about right. for the people. First of all, you had mentioned Exodus 18:21. Those are the qualifications for candidates for office. Let's go through that real quick. Yes, because it's very important. It says, but select capable men from all the people. Competent. Number one, they have to be competent. They've got to be competent. Men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate this honest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. So you got to be capable, capable, fear God, trustworthy, honest, hate dishonest gain. Yeah, you so have to those be an honest man, which is today people say, hey, wh why don't we get an honest politician? That's what the Bible has said for centuries. That's what you look for first thing. That's Why don't you get an honest politician? Because we're elected, and if we don't use those qualifications, we're looking at how many jobs they can bring home. We're looking at what they can do for my pocket. No, I want to know, are you capable? Do you fear God? Are you trustworthy? Do you hate dishonest Because gain? if you do that, right. you get the benefits that politicians promise when you get character first. Now let me let me throw something in here. How do you know if a school board member or a city councilman or a mayor or a state, how do you know if they meet those qualifications? Particularly, how do you know if they fear God? Because if you're an American, you believe in God. Well, that's what people tend to think. Here's the easy way. Proverbs 8.13 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So if you're a God-fearing person, you're going to hate evil. Now what's evil? Well, evil is what God defines as evil. So let me give you two easy ways. Hate what God hates. You gotta hate what God hates and love what God loves. God hates the shedding of innocent blood, abortion. God hates homosexuality. Those Not are two things he's unequivocal on. So you can ask any public official at all, where do you stand on abortion 
and homosexuality. Based on that response, you know whether they fear God. Because if they said, I'm fine with abortion, I'm fine with homosexuality, you know that they don't understand that they're going to account to God for what they do. Here's another action item, and it would be this, to stand against unelected elements, whether it's bureaucrats or judges. I will tell you, we have a lot of unelected people all across the United States that are running our you lives. Betcha. You had talked about this previously, that we have the Congress who passes a law, but what we're really doing is Congress is sloughing off the responsibility for writing the law to unelected bureaucrats in the agencies. And so trust me, they're more than happy to write the laws yeah. because they get to write it to help the bureaucracy against the people. That's right. And so it's important that the elected members of Congress take the time to write the law. Does it take time? You bet it does. But maybe we wouldn't have so many laws that are confounding us if we do exactly that. That's it's right. just really important. And then finally, we have to hold our leaders accountable. Let me hit this real quick because we have a lot of complaining about people. I don't like those elected guys. They don't do anything I want. Do you know only one out of eight Americans has ever contacted an elected official at any level? So if that's true, then the people watching this episode need to know how powerful that's their exactly voice right. will be. That's so exactly that's right. the other side of it. We may never get more than one out of eight, but you be that person who's the one out of you eight. Be the one. You understand the issues. You understand your jurisdiction. That's right. You understand the politician's jurisdiction. That's right. And you hold them accountable. I just read about an election in my hometown that quite literally was won by one vote. Wow. It was over a thousand votes on either side. One vote. It'll make a huge difference in that particular community. So be that person. So summing it up, the first thing is memorize Exodus 1821 and then understand. use that at yeah. every level where you vote. Yeah. Second thing is don't put up with the unelected aspects of government trying to become more powerful. Do not see yeah, that demand, power. Demand, demand, demand accountability from accountability. your elected officials. And third is talk to your elected officials. Nobody does yeah, that. You talk go yourself. You go yourself. You do it. And don't be afraid. I have people who are afraid all the time. Well, guess what? You know who's going to answer a phone? Maybe a 22-year-old intern. So don't be afraid of that person on the other end of the line. That's but right. also ask of your elected official and demand come to my home, come to my backyard, come to my church, come to my community center. If I get 100 people in that room, will you come? Yeah. You will make such an impression on that official. That's right. When they have to go back and vote, trust me, they're not going to forget that 100 faces and the 100 whites of their eyes. Nothing scares a politician more than the whites of their constituents' eyes. So make sure you get them out in your backyard and tell them what you expect. If we'll do that, we'll preserve the foundations of freedom. Oh, and isn't that exciting? We it can is do fun it. Stuff.